Welcome back to Feed the Post. I am your host, Joe Jackson, and today we are back with another Big Ten team preview. We are getting close to the end. Only a few more of these to get through. I mean, by the time this is posted, it will be October, um, a month away from the start of college basketball season. I'm very excited, and I'm very excited for the team that we are talking about today, and that will be the UCLA Bruins. I'm joined by Mike, Mike Regalado of Bruin Report and What's Bruins Show. Mike, I appreciate you coming on. How's it going? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, quite excited to talk about basketball because football not going so well. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, basketball be a, a good um, way to kind of veer off of that, and a team mm-hmm. that I'm very excited for. Um, I'm not gonna con- like. I'm not. I'm gonna give myself the ability to change it in the next couple of weeks if I do want to. But as of right now, I think I would have UCLA uh, number one in terms of Big Ten power rankings preseason if I were to do it. That's just because of the depth, and we're going to get into all of that. Before we get into the upcoming season, though, let's talk a little bit about last season. Um, 16 and 17 overall for UCLA. Very much there There was points where they looked decent. There was obviously also times they struggled a lot. Looking back, just kind of your brief overall thoughts on last year. Well, it was really tough to go from the previous year where you, where you have guys like Jalen Clark, Jaime Hawkins, uh, Tiger Campbell, David Singleton. I mean, they lost more than 50% of their uh, points and rebounding production from that team. So Cronin had to scramble and it it was hard. You know, it's, it's as a coach, you really have to figure out how you want to balance things out because the majority of those guys were either seniors or juniors or, or, you know, a few of them, I believe had a one extra year of eligibility, but they all just kind of left at the same time. But in the process, you're trying to recruit, you're trying to bring guys in. And it, the result is that so many, what, six guys left, I believe. So uh, Mick Cronin had to replace all of that. And he tried to go overseas for a few players. Uh, he uh, dipped into the transfer portal, uh, looked into the transfer portal, uh, went into high school recruiting, but the the result was just a um, a very young team that was not really aligned with how Mick Cronin coaches and, and teaches basketball. Uh, I mean, imagine going from, you know, uh, a group of guys that went to the Final Four and uh, consecutive uh, Sweet 16s uh, under Mick Cronin uh, just chemistry, just off the charts, to a bunch of newbies that are just trying to figure out what's going on. And especially the fact that since uh, Cronin hit the international market, um, th- there was a language barrier. So just trying to figure out what this what this coach is saying, who's screaming at you in a language you have no idea <laughs> what he's saying. Uh, very difficult. But uh, yeah, um, he went into the tra- he he hit the transfer portal hard. Um, after last season, um, you know, there were guys that, that moved on <clears throat> that, um, you know, I don't want to speculate why they moved on, you know, maybe they, you know, personally, they, they figured they could find a better situation elsewhere, but, um, yeah, they lost a, a handful of guys as well. And Cronin had to, um, he had to re up and things went a lot differently, uh, this past uh, season as he, uh, really hit the transfer portal and got in some uh, brought in some guys that have a lot of experience and guys who are upperclassmen and guys who are should be ready to participate um, and be just just one hell of a deep team. So yeah, last year unfortunately didn't work. Um, you had guys like uh, Adem Bona who uh, was the uh, defensive player of the year, which is great for UCLA, but one guy can't do it all especially a a post player. Um, I'm not saying post players can't do it. You know, I cover UCLA, which uh, uh, spawned uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton, which were definitely game changers, but uh, it it just did not come together. There were, uh, you know, shooting was an issue. Rebounding uh, defense was not where Mick Cronin wanted it to be. So the guys that he brought in, this seems to be on par with, uh, with, with what a Mick Cronin team um, is required to do. And uh, it's, it's, it's just deep. It is so deep. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and for me, like I cover the big 10, I'm not going to act like I I watched much UCLA last year, but from kind of the, what I've dug back into from last year and watching their film and stuff. Yeah. 
just kind of never quite got there. Lots of moving pieces. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked a little bit about the offseason that, that they had this year and, and what I think is a really, really good one. There's also a, another big piece of the offseason, and that's uh, UCLA joins the Big Ten. And so I know you cover football as well, so you're already in a way kind of integrated into that. But I guess just your overall thoughts on how, like, other than maybe just like pure travel, how this kind of impacts UCLA and your thoughts on, I guess, all of it just kind of joining the Big Ten in general. Yeah, there, there's just a lot of differences uh, across the board. Um, one of the big differences, obviously, they're going to have to uh, do a lot of uh, travel, traveling, as you said, but uh, similar to what um, UCLA has done, what, what, what most teams do, they'll, they'll do like uh, uh, two game trips where they'll kind of book trips like uh, Illinois and Indiana. They're not too far from each other, but they're, they're not going to do like Washington on a Thursday and Rutgers on a uh, Saturday. That's just not what's going to happen. The Big Ten uh, did a good job, uh, in my opinion, of putting guys together, uh, putting teams together, or like traveling partners, so that uh, they can minimize the amount of travel that they do have. Um, so so it's, I don't think it's going to be that bad. You know, once you fly across the country um, and you're settled in, in a city and then uh, – the next day or, or the day after you have to uh, fly, you know, to the next state or, you know, just you, not that far. It's, it's not going to be that big a deal. Um, but what's uh, one thing I did notice is that uh, the PAC 12 uh, schedule was mainly based around Thursday, Saturday games. Occasionally they'll have a Wednesday or a Friday or a Sunday, but it was basically a Thursday, Saturday league, not in the big 10. <laughs> There were, there were Sunday games, Monday, Tuesday games, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, I think the, the majority of the, the days they don't play are Wednesdays and Thursdays. So that's going to be bizarre. That's going to throw off UCLA's practice schedule because what they usually do is they'll practice, um, you know, beginning of the week. Uh, you know, media, media covers them usually on Tuesdays, maybe Wednesdays, depending on what, who the, uh, the, what the travel situation is. But now they got to rethink all of that. And I'm sure that they're that they're covering that, uh, no problem. Uh, but that's it, it is quite a different uh, schedule setup. That that's one thing I noticed. Yeah, and I didn't even I had never I hadn't even thought about that. Of like the practice schedule, and like you said, I'm I'm familiar I'm a familiar enough with the Pac-12 schedule. I know it was very much Thursday Saturday. It was like your you have your pods right that they kind of did. Yeah, um, yeah. Big Ten is seven days a week this year, especially this year. Last year. Mondays weren't usually games, and then towards the end, Fridays <laughs> weren't. But it's pretty much just it, it pretty much just go 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 at this point, and that's mm-hmm. I mean that's what happens when I guess when you have eighteen teams, you got to get through. Um, but yeah, wow. it's, it'll be yeah, it'll be interesting, and even just the right, even just the how the conference championship works. Of there's this will be the most unbalanced scheduling there can possibly be, where you play basically every team once. Half of them are going to be home, half of them yeah. are going to be road. Um, and then a couple teams twice, and obviously the Pac-12. I'm calling I'm calling the four newcomers the Pac-4. It's just kind of <laughs> my, my nickname for them. The Pac-4, obviously, they play all each other twice. So it's like if on the chance that USC, Oregon, you know, Washington are good, that obviously plays into that for UCLA. But I started off at the top of the show. Like I, I think that this is probably going to be the best team in the UCLA or in the Big Ten. A lot of that's depth, and, and we're going to kind of go through – just kind of the overview of the position groups and starting with the guards. That's probably, I probably the deepest individual like position group. I think in the big 10 of what I'm counting as a guard, Dylan, Andrews, Sebastian, Max, Sky Clark, Trent Perry, Dominic Harris. Those are five dudes that like, if day one, any of those five are starting, I'm like, that makes sense. Like that, that I understand why that could happen. Yeah. Do you, I know we're a month out and, and all that. Do you see more of like a, or I guess, what would you guess would be kind of the starting combo and kind of minutes rotations? Like, is there any chance all five play or do you think it's going to be more of like a three man type thing? You know, I, I, I will say uh, Dylan Andrews, uh, Sebastian Mack, uh, they're, they are returning starters. Um, Mack, I don't think he's going to be starting this year. Um, he still has uh, uh, a lot to learn. You know, he's going to be a sophomore, and he was one of the bright spots on UCLA last year. He was a uh, very fiery, you know, uh, guard who attacked the basket uh, as as you want any 
player to attack the basket, but there were things like he needed to look uh, to kick the ball out, uh, to maybe uh, try to find a second pass, um, a second or third pass. But a year under Cronin, I think he'll uh, have that locked down. But um, I, I think he'll still play a lot of minutes. Dylan Andrews, he, from what I hear, he's just gained a lot of confidence. He is definitely going to be uh, PG1. So we have him up there. Um, the freshmen, uh, Trent Perry and, and Feeney, um, I think uh, j- just from what I've seen uh, last year, you know, n- not counting last year, just because he uh, Cronin had to use a lot of young guys. Um, I think they will have uh, fewer minutes, but at the same time, who knows? We saw what Ma- uh, Mac did last year. Um, so if uh, like, you know, for example, I, I'm hearing good things about Trent Perry. If he comes in and, and uh, latches onto the system really quickly, um, you know, he could get, you know, a ton of minutes, but honestly, I think it's uh, just seeing what Cronin does with his rotations. It, it just depends on who's putting in the effort, uh, you know, game in and game out, you know, if, uh, and, and, and I don't, I don't think these guys are going to slack, but maybe sometimes, you know, a game is just not going one guy's way. Um, last year, he did not have a deep bench to, uh, to, to, to dip into now. If it's like, if Max not having a great game, you know what? Hey, have a quick seat, you know, uh, Mac, get in there. Uh, Perry, get in there. Uh, so if, if anything, he has a lot of choices. Um, you know, I kind of joke with uh, some of my uh, my What's Brewing um, co-hosts. Uh, he, Mick Cronin could essentially platoon this team, <laughs> but, uh, but no, that doesn't seem to be um, – uh, that's clearly we're joking uh, uh, yeah. about that, but he, he, he honestly could do that and probably not skip a beat. But there's continuity with who he wants uh, to lead the team, uh, who, who he wants uh, to have the ball in their hands, who he wants to play off ball, who he wants to uh, d- defend in the backcourt. So uh, it's like you're saying, there's just so many options. And it is just kind of like I, I look at the roster going, wow, <laughs> they could use all of these guys. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's impressive. And then, you know, that's that's just the backcourt. Yeah, exactly. And we'll get to the wings and the bigs in a second. And um, like, I think for me, what exemplifies it the most is so Sky Clark obviously was an Illinois guy. We're mm-hmm. all very familiar with Sky Clark um, and, and his time at Illinois, which was kind of abrupt. And, and I think there is talk of like Sky, I'm, I'm not saying this, but talk of like Sky Clark isn't like a quote unquote winner, right? Or, or stuff like that. Um, and my rebuttal to that at this point is what I've come to is like, like UCLA doesn't need Sky Clark or they don't like they don't need all five guys to hit. They need three to four. I'm not saying Sky Clark won't. I think Sky Clark could be very good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that's where the depth is with that guard room. It, it's like really hard to imagine like three of the five not performing well, like just given the talent. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Dominic Harris will be one of the, probably the best shooters in the country. Yeah, Trent Perry yeah. will be be you know, one of the better freshmen, like if he's given the role, could be one of the best fresh, better freshmen in the conference. You kind of know what you're getting with Andrews, Mack, and Clark already. Yeah. Um, I guess the one question with that, and, and obviously this is all a very good problem to have of minutes and all that. Do you have any concerns about the group kind of gelling together? And, and we can kind of draw this to the kind of the rest of them as well, but especially for the guards, just with how they could kind of interact with each other on the floor. No, you bring up a good point because that is something that uh, is very important to a team. I mean, look at, uh, you know, I referenced uh, UCLA two years ago uh, with Hawkes and and Jalen Clark and Tyre Campbell. Those guys were playing together. Uh, what, five, six, seven guys were playing together for three, four years. Uh, that's why they were so good. That's why they were so uh, dominant defensively, why they could just squeeze the life out of teams and then uh, run it back uh, on the offense. On the, on the offensive side, um, now UCLA has uh, they they have a lot of good defenders, but they have a lot of guys that can score as well. But to your point, that does worry me a little bit. Um, you know, only one off season to kind of get this together. Sure that sure they have uh, summer workouts, but how are they going to come together? How are all of their different styles going to mesh? Obviously, McCronin is going to figure that out, but it's not just like saying, "Oh, I see, I see what you're doing. Uh, maybe I'll put you in this lineup." No, it, it you know you really have to. And, and and to his credit too, he really looked into the portal to see what type of player he was bringing. And uh, you know he wasn't you know he wasn't just going to bring in anybody. I mean, the fact that you uh, that you bring in someone like um, uh, uh, who was it? Um, 
Eric Daly uh, or, 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 or William Kyle uh, from South Dakota State. South Dakota yeah. State. But then you look, he was conference defensive player of the year. Those are the guys who, you know, Cronin thinks that he can uh, really use. And, you know, he's Cronin's a Division I basketball coach. He knows the recruiting circles. He knows coaches who know about these players. Uh, he has friends in the business. So, uh, he, you know, there are a lot of avenues for him to explore to really research who these players are. And he did his homework on getting these guys in. And, oh, really quickly, I wanted to say this uh, really quickly. Um Division one schools are allowed 13 scholarship players. UCLA has 14. And how are they offsetting that? NIL money. So the 14th player, um, I don't think they revealed who it was, but the 14th player is covered scholarship wise. He doesn't have a scholarship, but he, he's covered monetarily because of NIL, which has really improved uh, at UCLA. So there's that. But um, yeah, no, just it, the chemistry, I'm, I'm wondering how it is. Uh, especially because we want to see the vocal leaders. You know, it's been said that, you know, Dylan Andrews has been better, but he's not as vocal and he has to be a little more, bit more vocal. But then you have guys like uh, Lazar Stefanovic, who uh, he, he he transferred in from Utah. Uh, he was one of the veterans last year. And Mick Cronin even said he needs him to be to step up even more. Even if he doesn't start, even if he doesn't play as much as he did last year, uh, he has to really use his voice and really – drive in to the new uh, players' heads what it means to to wear the four letters across their chest. So I, th- I think if they can get the the, the returning guys, the, the, the UCLA veterans, uh, to really help assimilate the new guys, I think they'll be okay. But there is um, – uh, it, it might take a little bit of time, hopefully not too much. And from what we've heard, it looks good so far, but – um, I, I, I can see, you know, a few maybe mi- mi- missteps here and there early on, but uh, Cronin does a good job of getting these guys in shape. I'm sure by mid-December, uh, late December, these th- this team will be running on all cylinders. Yeah, and I definitely agree with a lot of that. Um, and, and jumping to the wing group now, Lazar Stefanovic, you mentioned, Kobe Johnson, Eric Daly, uh, Brandon Williams, Eric Freeney is kind of who I have in this group. The first thing that stands out to me about this group is it feels like a lot of different skill sets, which is, I think, a very good thing. A lot of it's going to be the theme for UCLA is they should be able to match up in a lot of different ways with teams. Mm -hmm. Um, But then the common theme that's going to be similar to the guard group is like who exactly does play right. Kobe Johnson, a a really, really good defense player. I don't remember. Does he he either won defensive player of the year in the Pac-12 twice or he was all defense team? Um, He's a defensive team. Yeah. Yeah. He's a guy that's, you know, um, played like 30 to 35 minutes the past couple of years at USC, like mm-hmm. finding him minutes. Obviously, Stefanovic, you mentioned, was kind of the um, he was one of the leaders last year. Like he got a lot of minutes. But then you bring in like an Eric Daly, who maybe didn't have the best freshman year, but probably fits in better at UCLA. Um, like, is it going to be just a lot of Stefanovic and Johnson, do you think? Or, or do you think he'll find ways to get like Daly and Williams and uh, maybe not Freeney with being a freshman, but even Freeney to a degree in. Um, yeah, like I said, with you know, Freeney, we'll have to see how he acclimates, how he, uh, how his maturity, not not mentally, but physically, how his physical maturity allows him to uh, work in this system. But uh, you know, he, and this was because uh, they didn't have as stacked of a of a roster um, as they did two years ago. Um, but two years ago. Um, we would see uh, UCLA play four four guards or you know two guards two wings and and one big man. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they could do like uh, three guards in the backcourt and, and two post players. So if if it doesn't work out with some wings, um, you know you could definitely throw in a guard there. You know and and one another thing that Cronin said is that he's gonna he with this team he's going to use the best matchups. If, if they play a smaller team, they can go smaller. If they play a bigger team, they can go bigger. If they play a team that runs, they'll run what right with them. Um, you know, they, uh, he'll, he'll, uh, trap on inbounds, but he's not going to do it all the time. You know, he has so many weapons that he can really disguise what he's going to bring on a, on a game to game basis. 
Yeah, and, and that's I think exemplified with this group. Um, because like even like a guy like Eric Daly is somebody that's interesting to me. Of like, I just don't think he fit what Oklahoma State wanted to do last year. Um, and, and I think the pitch for him from Cronin was like, not saying he'll be high may production level, but that type of role of this like, at times you know post up just like this point forward at times still really good score like that type of thing. And, and like you said, UCLA is going to have a lot of ways to kind of go at different teams depending on how they go. Um, but then you also have your staples in Johnson, Stefanovic, that's going to be like, hey, we need 35 minutes for both of you tonight. Like, just go out yeah. there and play 35, and they can do that as well. Um, I think jump into the big room is probably the biggest question mark out of the group, like out of the three for me. Um, Biladu, Adai Mara, Williams, Kyle, and Devin Williams, who I kind of have as the big room. I want to start with Bilodeau because I think when I watched his film transferring from Oregon State, I was just like, yeah, this like this is a UCLA player. Mm -hmm. not, yeah. that you, not that you necessarily agree, like have to think that this will happen, but am I crazy for thinking he could be the leading scorer on this team? Uh, possibly. He's he's a very good scorer. Um, and he was, you know, every time UCLA played Oregon State, you know, he was uh, one of two targets that UCLA really had to focus on. Like I loved his game when I was at Oregon state, just cause he was such a pain in the butt. <laughs> but now it's like, when, when I heard that uh, you, w when he uh, committed to UCLA, I was like, Oh, well, this changes a lot. Um, because last year we, we saw that um, UCLA had, uh, as I said before, a Dan Bona. Uh, they also had a uh, Burke Buyutunchel and uh, a Day, a Day Mara. Uh, well, unfortunately Burke, he's, he's moved on. And, uh, but a Day has, has stayed. Um, so they didn't, re you know, so basically UCLA had one post player. Now, again, they have options. Uh, and then going back to Mara really quickly, you know, he didn't pan out uh, as a lot of people hoped. Um, did take a little bit of time to kind of get in rhythm. Uh, you'd think that seven foot three, uh, I, 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 I kind of guess that a lot of people were like, oh, seven foot three, he's going to be able to, he's going he's gonna to be a rim protector. He's going to be able to, to, uh, uh, you know, make uh, baskets around the rim, you know, super easy. You know, he'll be a uh, terror in the paint. That's not exactly what happened. Uh, one of the things is that he definitely needs to put on weight. Um, but also like in the summer, he, he injured his foot. So he also had, uh, had to uh, focus on that. But word out of uh, uh, summer workouts is that since he had, couldn't do anything, you know, with his feet, he, he was hitting the weight room. So he was like working on his upper body. So that would be huge. Uh, if he can, you know, start pushing guys around, he's going to be dangerous, but, uh, back to Bilodeau, I think he's going to be uh, a great, um, addition to, uh, UCLA, uh, not just in the post, but just as a team, uh, in general, because like, as you said, uh, he, he does have the ability to, to, uh, be the leading scorer, uh, just such a, you know, he's just is really, you know, uh, he, he can really read defenses and he's really good around the basket. Uh, so yeah, he's the one guy that uh, I was really excited uh, that UCLA, I was able to get a commitment from. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like me just personally projecting, I think he's going to get a big role. Um, we've talked, we've mentioned so many times, right? Flexibility with this roster, lots of options with the playing the center position, I guess two parts to the question. One, does Vila do ever play the center position at times? And then two, when he's not, and, and which may be a good chunk, do you see it being more of like a 50-50 split maybe between Mara and like a guy like Williams Kyle? Um, Devin Williams also thrown in there, but like, or do you see maybe one of those three kind of emerging as like, no, he's like they're the go-to guy at the five? You know, I, I could see uh, possibly a splitting time with uh, William Kyle and and uh, Bilodeau. Um, you know, like, like I said, if, if, if Mara... Uh, gets up to speed, he, he could be uh, an active uh, participant. Uh, you also have Brandon Williams, which would mostly, uh, he would uh, probably play more of a power forward uh, yeah. position. But uh, I mean, uh, you know, I hate going back to it, but it, it, like, like as, 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 it, as it's a common theme, but just so deep, just the fact that there are four guys that you can choose from uh, and, rely on basically to handle, you know, uh, uh, protecting the rim or scoring around the rim. Um, that's going to be really fun to see. Uh, but balancing it, trying to keep guys happy, trying to, you know, they all realize that th this is a Mick Cronin team and Mick Cronin, um, he wants to win. Yeah. So how do you please Mick Cronin? 
give them wins, put the ball in the basket, play defense. So whoever emerges as that guy or those two guys or three, they're going to play. And it seems like UCLA has it uh, with, uh, amongst their big men. Yeah. And, and I agree with that for sure. Um, and yeah, like this is this roster, it, it's the only one in the big 10, maybe the country, but at least the big 10 where it's like, there is legitimately 11 to 12 guys where if they found a, a big role, I'm not like shocked. Like I'm like, yeah, that it just makes sense that yeah, they're, he's just good. That makes sense that he's playing, you know, 20 minutes a game. Um, we'll see how that all shakes out. I'm glad I don't have to decide how to distribute minutes because that's going to be, <laughs> it's a good problem to have for Cronin, but also probably not the most fun to have because there's going to be, you know, every game, probably three guys at least where he's like, man, I probably could have tried to get them a little bit more minutes. A um, couple more kind of, we'll go a little bit of offense, a little bit of defense, and then we'll kind of get out of here. Starting with the offense. And last year, obviously really, really struggled. Um, a lot of it, you know, there was a lot of, just kind of creation that needed to happen from Andrews and Mac. Outside of that, it wasn't always super consistent. And even with that, yeah. there's a lot of growing pains. Do you see like these guys fitting together to put together a better offensive system? Right. Last year's a lot of pick and roll, a lot of mid range. It's kind of been a Cronin staple. Do you see this roster that he's put together kind of fitting into that well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like they, as good as that. Uh, team two years ago was <clears throat> they were not necessarily an offensive team and we were hearing that the offense was uh, ha had improved uh, from from the year previous but they were not what anybody would call an offensive juggernaut defensively yeah um, I mean and then you have a guy like Jaime Hawkes who could he was a great defender and he put a lot into his offensive game uh, but he was he was pretty much the most consistent offensive player, um, definitely the best two-way player for UCLA. But now you have guys that, I mean, how many of these transfers, I think all of these transfers uh, averaged over 10 points a game. Mm -hmm. That's, that's huge. Uh, when you can consistently get that from um, most, you know, every guy on the court, that's definitely going to help you. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see, what type of offense it is. I don't think it's going to be like, you know, run and shoot, like, uh, you know, fast breaks here and there. I think they are going to really try to go from offense to defense. Um, but uh, they play a lot of uh, half court uh, basketball and I think they're going to stick with that, but they have guys who are smarter, more mature and have been, have, pl have played the college game, um, you know, a few years some of them, you know, upperclassmen. So I think that is really going to help out. And especially just the knowledge that all of these new guys have, as well as the, uh, the, the returners from last year, it, it's just going to be, uh, it, it's going to be pretty fun. I hope it's not clunky to start. Uh, might be some growing pains here and there, but yeah, I think they'll put it in a sixth gear. Uh, like I said, you know, once uh, mid to late December comes around. Yeah. And it, it all ties back to, there's so many options like, if one guy struggles, somebody else is going to be able to take his place and, and fill on the offensive end. Yeah. Last year, defense was fine, like 50th per Ken Palm, but that's not probably up to Cronin's standards. No. Um, <laughs> what do you think is the most important thing for UCLA to get back to kind of being that, you know, staple Cronin kind of type defense? One that I will say, and even on the offensive end, um, out of the four pack four teams, like Cronin and UCLA, definitely stylistically, most just ready for the big 10 of they're cool playing of you know 55 to 53 just slugfest at times but yeah. for the defensive end like what do you think is kind of most important to get back to well i think one thing that's really going to help is that they're getting a jalen clark type of player in kobe johnson which they did not have last year they did not have a lockdown uh defender um you know guys like lazar stefanovich would you know did a decent job but they were not um uh, uh, jalen clark well, now you got Kobe Johnson coming in here, um, and he's a guy who, from what I hear, is really taking his role seriously. Um, you know, he'll be able to score, but uh, I, I, his strength is more just shutting guys down. And I think with uh, having more experienced guys and, uh, you know, guys like uh, Eric Daly, William Kyle, those guys are just going to just really help lock down passing lanes, um, you know, cut off uh, lanes into the basket. Uh, it, it's just going to be so much tighter than it was last year. Uh, we're, it's going to be more reminiscent of what we saw in the previous years. Um, 
uh, with previous uh, Mick Cronin teams, uh, both at UCLA and Cincinnati, uh, and heck, probably even better. It's it's going to be. It just kind of blows my mind how much better this team um, will be, both offensively and defensively. But to get back to that type of Mick Cronin defense, I think that that's the most exciting thing for me. That's that's. I, I, I love defensive uh, uh, basketball. Like when Ben Helen was at UCLA, just absolutely love that they just shut guys down. Um, <laughs> it's kind of painful to watch, uh, you know, a, a uh, 52 to 48 game. But at the same time, just seeing how the defense just locks people down. I think we're going to get back to that uh, this year. So I'm, I'm quite excited to see uh, the defense becoming a Mick Cronin defense once again. Yeah, and there's, you know, as, as painful as it is, there's sometimes beauty in those 52 to 48 games. And, oh, uh, yeah. The Big Ten's not immune to those. They, they are not immune to those mm, at yeah. all. So um, should be fun. I'm, I'm very excited to see UCLA match up stylistically with West of the Big Ten, but also just themselves in general. Um, yeah. Okay, a couple quick hitters, and then we'll get you out of here. Um, who is the X Factor on this team to you? God, there's so many guys. You know, I do think it's Dylan Andrews. I think... His maturity, and if, from what we're hearing, his leap from last year to this year, because um, he had to learn on the fly. But, but he was he was a freshman the year that uh, uh, Tiger, uh, during Tiger Campbell's last year, so he was thrown into the mix to become PG one last year, and he just had to. There was no real backup. Um, Sebastian Mack played some uh, point guard, but he's not a point guard. Um, I. I'm blanking on either way. Um, he had to learn on the fly essentially, uh, but putting more focus into that role, I think he's going to be a, you know, he, yeah, he's going to be the X factor. He's going to be the guy that leads them out there every night who runs the offense. Uh, he's, his defense is, is going to improve. So I just think that overall, he's just going to make this thing run. You know, he's the driver, he's in the driver's seat and he's going to, you know, turn this souped up, you know, Chevy into a, a contender once again. So, uh, yeah, it was a little broken down last year, but <clears throat> they put more pieces into it and it's, it, this team is going to race. Yeah, for sure. And that's probably who I would go with to throw out another name. I will go back to Biladu because mm -hmm. I'm more of just, I believe I'm, I'm all in on him fitting in with this team and, and what he can do on the offense. Like, I, I think there's. I think he could be one of the better scorers in the Big Ten this year. I, I really do. Um, another quick header: most impactful newcomer this year for UCLA. I got to say, Kobe Johnson. I just, from what I'm hearing about his defense, <clears throat> just to have that one guy who just shuts dudes down. That's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, and you can't go wrong with that. And he's a guy that can play 40 minutes basically if you need him to. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like he's like gives nothing on the offensive end. He can still still score some, but obviously defense is that calling card. Last one, and you don't have to go super in depth on kind of the details of this, but like, what do you think the floor and kind of ceiling for this team are? That's weird because it depends on how quickly they uh, they can mesh. If, if if for some weird reason they just don't mesh, uh, you know, styles, you know, maybe um, you know they, they they just a few guys just don't mix with Mick Cronin style, which I hear they do. Like <clears throat> Mick Cronin did a really good job of, of researching these guys. But uh, I would say like floor would probably be, I'm just with so much talent, maybe fifth or sixth, seventh in the big 10 uh, ceiling. Definitely. They are going to be a competitor for the uh, big 10 championship. I think that they might have, I don't want to get crazy. I'm not going to make this prediction. I'm just saying there's a possibility if everything goes well, uh, or maybe a, re a return to the final four. If anything, uh, you know, Sweet 16 appearance. But, uh, yeah, I think that there's enough buy-in and experience and talent to really take this team far. Yeah, and I'm with you there. Ceiling is winning the Big Ten, making a deep run. Floor is, yeah, kind of that upper middle of the Big Ten. Like I think, with I, like you said, there's so much talent. It's hard to see them slipping too, too far. But there's also so many teams in the Big Ten in that area of, like, you know, there's so many teams that could be good or could be bad. That middle is just going to be so clustered and it's going to be interesting to see. I've said it multiple times. I'm very, very excited to watch UCLA this year and see what they're able to do. Um, I appreciate you coming on and talking through UCLA with me. Let everybody know where they can find you and your work. 
Uh, yeah, I'm at uh, BruinReportOnline.com. Uh, also, uh, I do the What's Bruin uh, What's Bruin Show podcast, which uh, records every Tuesday night. Uh, <laughs> and I could be uh, found on the Twitter at Mike Rigolato LA. Yep. So his links will will be down in the description. Definitely go check him out. Uh, appreciate him coming on to talk UCLA. You can follow me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Going to have a ton of film content coming out this season. Um, at the time of this posting, there's already a UCLA kind of film breakdown of what they could try to do on the offensive and defensive end. So check that out. Also have a UCLA uh, newcomers preview where I go in depth on each individual UCLA newcomer. So those will also be linked in the description. Plenty of content to kind of cover everybody um, for the next month until real basketball starts again. And, and I'm very, very excited for that. So appreciate everybody tuning in and we will catch you in the next one.